Welcome to Season 2 of the Resonant Restoration Podcast. I'm your host for these enticing, enigmatic, and erratic discussions, Sean. The goal of this podcast is to spark conversation and highlight restoration projects and topics. We took a break from this production for a while as life got busy for several reasons, and I appreciate your patience. This podcast is produced in part with the generous contributions from our patrons over at Patreon, including Jay, Simone, Garrett, Michael, and Arnie. We have also now started producing small video segments related to restoration, and those can be found on our YouTube channel. On this episode, I talked with Ellen Brandell, who is an infectious disease wildlife ecologist. Be careful, the conversation about wolves is contagious. This interview was recorded before the season break, and there is a discussion about the election that is now not so timely. In case you are wondering, the wolf reintroduction initiative in Colorado that we mentioned indeed passed. It's time to pull on the conservation-oriented heartstrings with the charismatic keystone species, and without further banter or ado, let's unpack the wolf pack. Don't worry, we talk about scat as well. So, hi Ellen, and welcome to the podcast. Yeah, hi. Nice to be here with you today, Sean. Can you start off by telling the audience about yourself and your background? So I'm originally from Michigan, and I grew up in the suburbs, kind of in the Detroit area. And growing up, I really didn't have any uh, wildlife experience, natural experience. I didn't really have much outside time besides just, you know, playing in my backyard and there's um, some woods behind our house. Very interested in science growing up. I always saw myself as becoming a vet actually and um, when I was in high school kind of looking into what I could do in college I came across wildlife biology and I didn't even know it was a thing. Never heard of it before. I started looking into it and touring some colleges looking for wildlife biology programs and the rest is history. I've basically been outside and studying animals and ecology from then on. So I went to the University of Montana. I got an undergrad degree. And yeah, now I'm pursuing my PhD in ecology at Penn State University. And really, I've had a great time so far just with wildlife research. I've done field research in the Western United States and Western Canada for the past about gosh, I don't know, eight, nine years now. So it looks like you are a disease ecologist. Can you explain that? Yeah, so I'm a wildlife disease ecologist. And essentially what disease ecologists do is they study the interactions between infectious diseases, their hosts, and the environment. So an infectious disease is a micro or macro parasite. Anything from really tiny little things that you can't see, like a bacteria or a virus, to uh, larger infectious agents like intestinal parasites, worms, mites, and ticks. And so they're like the creepy crawlies, basically. And uh, micro and macro parasites live on or in their hosts. By definition, they derive their resources from their host. And so disease ecology is basically the investigation of where are we seeing these infectious agents, what's happening to their hosts, and how is that moderated by the environment? Um, disease ecology is a huge field. It can range from anything from kind of what I do, which is um, studying big animals and their infections to studying just one host and the interactions of two different strains of bacteria within that host. So it's, it's a really huge field. So a lot of your writing and research Looks like it has to do with wolves. Can you explain how you got into that as well? Started working with wolves in 2015, and I was graduating from the University of Montana, and someone that was a graduate student there named Matt Metz, he hired me as a research technician for Yellowstone National Park. So I started working there as a field technician. So I would hike around Yellowstone and I'd look at wolf kills. So what animals were wolves killing? And I'd collect samples from them and collect data. And um, basically working in that system kind of gave me an in enough to do my graduate work there. And it's been super great. 
I've worked in Yellowstone now the past over five years and I've been working on wolves ever since. So that's kind of how I got into the Yellowstone system. Can you tell us a little bit about kind of the general environmental setting, the climate and what species you might find there? And Yellowstone is a really cool place. Yellowstone is actually the f- world's first national park. It was designated in 1872. Uh, basically Yellowstone's a volcano. It's a high elevation caldera and it was protected because of its geothermal activities. And Northern Yellowstone is where I can do most of my research and it's where most of the wildlife research happens because it's characterized by these big open valleys and you can see animals there. That's what Yellowstone is famous for in addition to the geothermal, it's just the high visibility of animals in the Northern part of the park. And then more in the central and Southern part of the park, there's these high dramatic peaks. It's really beautiful. The winters are very harsh. In terms of animals, Yellowstone is also famous for its rich and abundant group of carnivores. It has the most carnivores in terms of species and abundance of anywhere in the contiguous United States. So wolves, grizzly bears, black bears, cougars, and then of course the famous bison herd that lives in Yellowstone. So Yellowstone is the only place in the U.S. where bison have been living since prehistoric times. So this has really been the bison stronghold of, of the U.S. has been in Yellowstone. It's a pretty charismatic ecosystem. So since this is a restoration podcast, I have to ask, uh, do you know what the current state of wolf reintroduction is in the United States? Or can you speak on that? Yeah, definitely. So first I should tell you a little bit more about the Yellowstone system and wolves. So wolves were extirpated from Yellowstone and really the whole Western United States in the early 1900s. Um, And this was part of a big predator eradication campaign taking place across America. Wolves were gone, most predators were gone from the Yellowstone ecosystem and they were gone for about 70 years. And then wolves were reintroduced into Yellowstone in 1995 and 1996. And 31 wolves from Canada were brought into the Yellowstone region. So Montana, Wyoming, Idaho. And this has been touted as the most successful carnivore restoration in history. So wolves that were reintroduced in Yellowstone, that lineage of wolves now occupies Uh, Wyoming, Montana, Idaho has gone into Oregon, Washington, Colorado. These are all descendants, California even a little bit. These are all descendants from from that Yellowstone introduction. So it's been it's been super successful. I think people are really starting to understand the the importance of predators in the ecosystem. So for example, the ballot in November in Colorado there is an initiative to reintroduce wolves into Colorado. And that's a campaign that's been going on for years. And so it's finally now going to be voted on this year. And there have also been some wolf relocations back onto Isle Royal. So the Isle Royal wolf population is also a very famous population. They were down to just two wolves on that island. And so there was a campaign to bring back wolves onto that island. And um, the public generally supported it. And wolves have been, over the past two years, wolves have been relocated now to Isle Royal. So it seems like sentiment around wolves is shifting a little bit, although they're still a very controversial species. Um, I, I think and I hope that people are starting to realize how important they are for the ecosystem. And I think Yellowstone is a lot to thank for that as setting this kind of example. It's a good reason for people to go out and vote too. (laughs) <laughs> go go support the wolves <laughs> yeah. and your preferred candidate for other things i won't get into that at the moment <laughs> uh, so what are the major takeaways associated with the social groups and disease transmission so it's a bit of a complicated question so i will do my best to answer it so from a pathogens perspective there's this trade-off of living in a social group. And so something interesting about wolves is that they are are pack living, right? So they live with individuals that they're related to, often their parents, and then a few unrelated individuals. And they have this really cohesive group that they live in this one territory. From the pathogen perspective, if you get into that social group, 
it's great for you because you're probably going to infect all members of that social group because they have high contact, um, they live close to each other, they hunt together, they share a den. And so you're probably going to be able to infect all of those group members. But then the challenge is groups often don't come in contact. And so from a pathogen perspective, once you've infected all the individuals of one group, they're either gonna become immune or they're gonna die or they're gonna clear the infection. So how do you then transmit to the next group in order to survive? And so there are these interesting relationships between contact rates between members of the same group, contact between members of different groups, pathogen survival in the host, off the host, that can create some really interesting patterns of infection. Yeah, that sounds interesting. Yeah. And when I was looking through some of your research on your website, I also noticed some interesting things between wolves and lions. And talking to you now, I can't remember the exact difference. So it'll be like a whole nother new experience. And it'll be awesome to hear your answer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I was interested in, in studying lions a little bit because wolves and lions, especially wolves in Yellowstone and lions in Serengeti, they're kind of these analogous species in analogous systems. So um, Yellowstone is this large protected area with these migratory prey and uh, Serengeti is very similar. It's this large protected area with migratory prey and these social carnivores, African lions and gray wolves act similarly in their ecosystems. So they are social carnivores that live in groups, they hunt large prey and they're important predators um, for multiple prey species on the landscapes. And what I was interested in is that both of these species suffer from infectious diseases, sometimes even the same infectious diseases. So for example, uh, canine distemper, which is a virus that is pretty lethal, and it's called canine distemper, but it can actually infect many carnivore species, and it can infect lions. And so I looked at how wolves and lions use space on the landscape. So how do they move around and what, where do they occupy space? And if canine distemper infections change how they use space at all. So what I found was that for wolves, there's really no change in how they're moving around the landscape using space before or after these outbreaks of canine distemper. But for lions, they actually constrict their movement. And so they reduce their territory sizes and they reduce their contact with neighboring groups following some distemper outbreaks. And so even though these species can seem really similar, they might have differences in their behavior that allow them to adapt differently or survive differently from pathogen outbreaks. So yeah, it was pretty cool to study. Have you been able to infer any reason why there's that difference? So I think it has to do with mating system a little bit. And this is me maybe just going off on a tangent a little bit. But, but here's, here's, here's my proposal for why this happens, um, at least part of the reason maybe. So wolves are reliant on unrelated individuals coming into their pack in order to breed. So wolves have this have this tendency to not inbreed, right? So they're gonna disperse when they're related to too many individuals in their own pack, and they are going to accept individuals that are unrelated from them into their pack so that they can breed. Lions don't operate the same way. So a lion pride is made up of a big group of females and a lot of their offspring, and they're essentially stationary. Like the females don't move around a lot. And instead you have these little groups of males that travel around and mate with multiple prides of females maybe. And so for the, for the lion prides, they can contract their space and still be breeding if those males are traveling around. Whereas wolves have to have this constant influx and outflux of individuals from their pack in order to maintain their mating system. So I think that could be a driver partially. The other main difference is that this distemper outbreak, one in particular um, in 1994 in Serengeti, killed off a bunch of adult lions as well. And adult lions are the ones that maintain those territory boundaries. 
And in Yellowstone, we see mostly juveniles dying from distemper. And so they're not really in charge of where their territories are. It's mostly the adults. So the loss of adults could have caused these prides to contract because they weren't able to defend as big of a space. So there's, there's a bunch of alternative reasons for why we might see these differences in behavior. Yeah, I imagine. It must be interesting, though, as you were saying, like the analogous systems, and they're always surprising you. So on the podcast, I always like to ask how projects or research or environmental projects involve the community and different stakeholders. Has there been any involvement by partner organizations or community members in your projects? Oh, well, with wolves, there is always public opinion and public (laughs) involvement. Um, There is a vibrant wolf watching community in Yellowstone. So there is a group of people that live in the area or vacation in the area, and they are constantly out watching the wolves, can help you locate the wolves, and in general are, are a good resource and just a way to stay involved with the community. Specifically with my research, I ran a citizen science website for three years, Um, and I didn't set it up originally. A graduate student before me had set it up, but I ran it for three years, and I collected information on mostly mange infection, sarcoptic mange, which is a skin mite that causes hair loss in its hosts, and it's prevalent in Yellowstone, um, in wolves and coyotes. And so I had a website where people could report main sightings and upload photos. And my site had educational resources about wolves and disease. So that's, that's one way I stayed involved in the community. I actually received a small grant from a local community group that allowed me to test some samples. So that was great. And so the local community around Yellowstone and Grand Teton is really great for wildlife research in general. People care about it. And it's a good area for donors. So yeah, that there are, there are all these small funding opportunities that keep the community involved with your research. But just in general, people love to see wolves. People come to Yellowstone to see wolves. We, there are so many documentaries and books about Yellowstone wolves. Um, Nat Geo comes to Yellowstone every year to film wolves. Um, PBS, there's just the list goes on and on. And so it's been interesting to kind of have this local vision a little bit about what's going on in the park and the people I know, but also this kind of global magnifying glass on you and on your research because you are in Yellowstone. Talking about community a little more, you also had an opportunity to communicate a presentation to the, a group, I believe, and it was about fecal facts. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, that is a group called 500 Women Scientists. Yeah. Was that just the grant that you got or they just wanted you to come explain? Yes. They asked me to come talk about research. They ask. Um, so this is a it's, I don't know if it's international, but it's at least a national organization where um, they promote women in science and have women speak, uh, women scientists speak uh, around the country at kind of just small events. And so I I did a a local talk and yeah, so my, (laughs) this is, this is some research that's currently underway. And the reaction I get from people is always really different when I, the whole thing is of talking about poop and worms. So it grosses most people out, but it's super interesting. (laughs) So, um, so basically I started a study two years ago, um, about two and a half years ago now where I've been collecting poop from wolves in the park and I've collected over 200 samples over the past two years. And I've been working with a bunch of different labs and we're testing these samples for a bunch of different things, including stress hormones. And we're also genotyping parasite samples. So intestinal worms, tapeworms, all the gross things. The goal really is to understand what intestinal parasites live in Yellowstone wolves and what are the trends through time and space. And we don't really know anything about that. And these studies are really challenging because they typically require a lot of samples and sampling the same individual through time and knowing a lot about that individual that you're sampling. So knowing their sex, their age, their social status, all these things that might 
affect parasite infection. And so Yellowstone is, to me, one of the only wild places you could really do that because we collar so many wolves, we follow them their whole lives, we know so much about these wolves that matching the poop sample on the ground to the wolf that we know is actually tangible. So yeah, that's um, a study. I have some preliminary results, but it's not completely finished. It's been, uh, it's been a very interesting study trying to collect poop from wild wolves year round in Yellowstone. So yeah, it means from scat analysis, you can figure out what they're eating for sure. You can get genetics of the wolf, so you can know which wolf um, was where and when and what they ate. And then you can also know about the health of that wolf from their scats. You can know um, if they're pregnant, you can know um, what they're infected with. And so poop is just like this amazing resource that tells you so much about whoever is pooping. So in Montana, there seems to be a large ranching community. That's probably putting it lightly. Yes. Yeah. Is Yellowstone far enough removed from those types of stakeholders or have there been any issues with or controversy there? So the biggest issue with wolves in the West, uh, I would say to the ranching community or that they will occasionally predate livestock. So I think one disconnect between scientists and the ranching community lies here is that as a scientist, it's easy to say, oh, you know, wolves in Montana only kill X amount of cows per year. I'm just going to say 50. I'm making that up. I don't know. But if you're, if you're the rancher that lost those 50 cows, that's your livelihood. I mean, that could be your, your annual income. And so 50 cows on the, on the scale of the state seems like nothing. But to those individuals that lost those cows, that is everything. And so I think that is a little bit where the disconnect lies is that scientists are used to, you know, averaging or looking at things from a broader scope or looking at numbers, you know, proportion of cattle that were killed by wolves is very, very small, but to individual people, it can be a very big deal. So Yellowstone um, on the north side of it, um, specifically the northwest side of Yellowstone, is surrounded by ranching communities. Uh, people that they need their cattle, they need, um, there's actually a bison ranch outside of the park. And so, yeah, there, there have definitely been problems with wolves in that area and ranchers. I think another big problem in terms of like public perception is that people get very attached to wolves in Yellowstone. There have been wolves that have had entire books written about them from Yellowstone. Um, there are famous wolves that come out of Yellowstone. And so people get very attached. And I think it just continues to polarize the problem. So we have this group of people who's very attached. And then we have this group of people that hate wolves. And there, there seems to be no middle ground. And so that is where other problems arise from, for sure. Yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so do you have any advice for young folks getting started in ecology? Yeah, sure. So I think what I have learned the most in my early career is seeking out your own opportunities. So when I first was going to college, um, I had no experience with wildlife, anything. I had interned at a vet for a year, so I had a little bit of experience with animals, but I mean, nothing really in, in a wildlife setting. And the first thing I did was I went around to professors and I just asked if I could help with anything, if I could go out and help them collect data, if I could help them in a lab, if I could do anything that they needed, basically. And um, to my surprise, a lot of people didn't do that. I thought that would be what everyone was doing, but it wasn't. So I would just say, go out and ask people what you can do, how you can help, can you volunteer? Because I got my very first field technician job my freshman year of college working on snowshoe hares. And it was awesome. We went out and collared snowshoe hares, rode around on snowmobiles and tracked them and how their um, phenology changed through winter and spring. And it was an awesome project. And I started doing that right away. And from then on, I had had field job after field job just by talking to people and asking questions and putting myself out there. And so 
my advice for anyone that is trying to get into the field is just you got to be a little bit bold and it, it'll pay off. It's also a good way to get real experience when you're first trying to figure out exactly what direction you want to go. Mm -hmm. If you're a freshman working on those types of projects, you get to see what actually goes into the work instead of just reading about yes, it. Yes, exactly. You get to kind of troubleshoot as you go along and then realize, you know, maybe you don't like field work so much, maybe lab work or or the other way around, or yeah, exactly, whatever it is, you kind of figure out what you actually like to do. Okay, I have another question about wolves. Yeah. Where does lone wolf come from? Like the saying, like, you know, that people call someone a lone wolf. Oh. And like you were talking about how wolves are pack animals is just like, that. that's the weird one that doesn't. Yeah, that's actually funny. I never thought about where the, the funny thing about lone wolves is they, they die most of the time. So it's not really a great thing to be a lone wolf. I don't know. <laughs> Then don't be a lone wolf. <laughs> yeah, I don't know where that comes from, but um, yeah, they have to have a pack to survive, especially in somewhere like like Yellowstone, where the wolf density is so high that if you're just a loner wandering around, your chances of surviving are, are really not great. So what's the main cause of death for a wolf? I can't imagine they have a lot of predators. No, it's, it's mostly, I mean, other than hunting, because hunting is yeah, yeah. definitely a huge source of mortality. Uh, it's other wolves. Oh. Wolves are, are, like I said, highly territorial, and occasionally a wolf will have to, when a wolf is coming into a new pack, um, trying to become the breeder, they will occasionally have to kill the current breeder uh, to kind of take its place. Um, they will dispute over territory, and just one pack that's grown a little bit bigger, that's trying to maybe encroach on someone else's territory, they might get killed. Yeah, during denning season, there are there's a lot of aggression uh, coming in around the den areas, other packs trying to come in around other packs' dens, um, and that can lead to fatalities. So yeah, um, intraspecific mortality is a, is a huge source of mortality in Yellowstone. And then depending on the year, disease. So like I mentioned, canine distemper, which is highly lethal, we've had four notable outbreaks of canine distemper and they can kill up to 80% of all the pups born that year. Nice. Well, not, not nice. so nice, but <laughs> makes sense. It's good to know. Uh, okay. I just keep thinking of random questions now. So going back to the, the fecal matters, uh, I think I read somewhere that most animals know not to eat their own poop because diseases can get transmitted. Depend, totally depends on the animal. Well, then I see like my dog walking down yeah. the road. He just eats cat poop all the time. <laughs> like his, his favorite morsel. And I just don't understand. Is there some incentive for yeah. animals to eat other animals' poop or their own species? Yeah, there poop? is actually. So, um, so a species that eats its own poop is called coprophagic. And I believe that's... Oh, well, you're blowing my mind right and now. And <laughs> so that is actually a trait of a lot of lagomorphs. So rabbits and rodents. And so what happens is they break down, they can't break down all of the fibers of um, the plant material that they eat the first time. And so it's, it's basically partially digested and they're only getting part of the nutrients the first pass through the digestive tract. So the first time they eat something and poop it out, they didn't get all the nutrients from it and um, they weren't able to break it down all the way. And so they'll actually eat the, the poop and then eat it. And then the second time it goes through, they'll be able to extract more of the nutrients from it. So it's not a trait in carnivores. Dogs are just special and like to eat poop. But for rats and rodents and lagomorphs, they actually purposefully, I mean, not purposely because they're not thinking about it, but they evolutionarily eating their own poop was advantageous because they could extract more nutrients from it. So they are eating their own poop on purpose. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. I mean, you, it's less effort, less energy to just eat the poop. Yeah. All right. Now, and <laughs> so, now you know. <laughs> I, I feel like I need a, one of those star banners, like the more you know. The more you know. I can't remember what that was <laughs> from. So I try to end most of my episodes with the question what is your favorite plant? So, what is your favorite plant? Oh, wow, that's so hard because some plants that you can eat, I really like those. Um, 
favorite flower like tree is totally different that's a hard question okay i'm gonna say i'll just go with favorite tree since that's on my mind um my favorite tree is uh ponderosa pine because they are big and beautiful and very important in western ecosystems and because their bark smells like vanilla so there we go all right perfect <gasps> All right. Well, thank you so much, Ellen. That was enlightening on many different fronts. Yeah. <laughs> I guess if people are interested, um, they can look me up. I have a website, Twitter, if anyone is interested in reaching out to me. Ellen E. Brandel dot Weebly dot com. And I think my Twitter, I think my Twitter is just Ellen E. Brandel. Thanks again. Uh, it was a pleasure. Yeah. Thanks for having me. The music on this podcast was Quiet Fury by The Music Teller. You can find him at themusicteller.com. The best way to support our podcast is to tell a like-minded friend or colleague. Human interaction is important. You can also visit our webpage at resonantrestoration.com and sign up for our newsletter and find links to our Patreon page. You can also find us on social media such as Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. So stay tuned for Resonant Restoration, and thank you for listening.